The man who would become Malik Ambar was born in 1548 in central Ethiopia, with the birth name of Chapu. His people, the Oromo, were relative newcomers in the region, taking advantage of the instability caused by an ongoing war to migrate into the country. Chapu's childhood was a traditional Oromo peaceful pastoralist life. 16th century Ethiopia was a land defined by slavery. While it impacted all communities, Solomonic Christians and Adel Muslims in particular targeted the largely spiritualist Oromos. By 1555, over 12,000 slaves per year were captured and sold in Ethiopia, stripped of their freedom and shipped out to serve elites from Cairo to the heart of Persia. Sure enough, at only 12 years old, Chapu was captured by Arabic traders, becoming a statistic in an epidemic slave trade that spanned across the Indian Ocean. The young boy was put on auction in a slave market in a port on the coast of Yemen. Young, scared and alone, the boy likely wondered if he would ever see his home or family again, while auctioneers peddled him as if he was no different to the coffee beans, musk, ivory and silk on sale in the bazaar. Chapu was quickly sold, eventually ending up in the hands of a merchant named Mir Kasim, who took him to the restored cultural center of Baghdad. Kasim gave his slave a new Arabic name, Ambar. He also taught him how to read, write, and manage the finances of his master's business. After a decade in the heart of the Islamic world, Ambar was taken on a journey with Mir Kasim, who sought greater business ventures in more exotic lands. In 1571, the master and slave reached the west coast of India, a region known as the Deccan. As a young man in his early twenties, Ambar had finally arrived in the place where he would make his mark on history. Much like Ethiopia, the Deccan was a land defined by war, intrigue and a delicate balance between its various peoples and religions. Politically, the plateau was divided into five sultanates, which typically were comprised of a ruling class of Muslim elites presiding over a mainly Hindu Marathi majority. Indo-Turks, Persians, and a smattering of European merchants also added to the land's social fabric. The rulers of this land walked along a dangerous edge. Violent coups were the norm, as sultans often found themselves slain at the hands of their own soldiers or via the work of rival sultanates. To compound matters, a new player had recently emerged in the game, the Mughal Empire. Founded by one Zahir ud Din Muhammad Babur, the Turkic dynasty had swept into the subcontinent, destroying the declining Delhi Sultanate in 1526. The Mughals established themselves as an imperial juggernaut in northern India, and licked their chops at the prospect of expanding into the small and divided sultanates to the south. Upon arrival in India, Ambar was once more sold. In the Deccan, Africans were known as Habshis, and were commonplace as slave soldiers or free mercenaries. Ambar's new master was the chief minister to the Sultan of Ahmednagar, a man known as Chengiz Khan, a name invoking the conqueror of old. Chengiz had much in common with Ambar. He too was of African origin and had once been enslaved. Since then, he had earned his freedom, and now commanded an army in the name of his lord, Murtaza of the Nizam Shahi dynasty. In meeting Chengiz, Ambar quickly learned that upwards mobility was possible for anyone in the Deccan, even a slave. Ambar began this new chapter of servitude as a soldier in training under his Habshi master. He was resolved to earn himself a higher position in life through determination and grit. He soon distinguished himself from the pack, catching Chengiz's eye with his impressive brawn, quick wit and thorough education. Chengiz soon decided to make him his personal aide, grooming him for leadership. Three years later, Ambar's sense of security was shattered once more. Courtiers jealous of Chengiz Khan's power had framed the minister for working against Ahmednagar, inducing the Sultan to have him executed. It was a harsh wake-up call to the reality of Deccanese politics. However, there was a silver lining. Following Chengiz's death, Ambar was legally a free man. 
After nearly two decades, the Oromo was in control of his own destiny. He travelled south to the neighbouring Sultanate of Bijapur and enlisted in the local army. It was during this time that he met Karima, a fellow Habshi. Eventually, Ambar would marry Karima and have four children with her. As the Bijapuri ruler passed away, leaving an underage son as his heir, responsibility for the guardianship of the realm fell to the Queen Mother, a woman known as Chand Bibi. This regent proved to be incredibly competent. Well aware of the cutthroat nature of Deccanese politics, she introduced the concept of fidelity to the salt, which espoused loyalty to the land itself rather than any one dynasty. The Sultana, as she was called, had many admirers. Chief among them was Ambar, who saw her as a role model. In time, Ambar had risen up in the Bijapuri ranks and built a small but dedicated following of mounted warriors with whom he had likely distinguished himself in various small-scale border skirmishes. His loyalty to Regent Sultana and his effectiveness in battle led to Chand Bibi's young son bestowing upon him the symbolic title of Malik, an Arabic word for chieftain or king. The year was now 1595, and the Mughal Empire had finally turned their attention back to the Deccan after suppressing rebellions in the east. For Emperor Akbar, it was a good time to invade. Ahmednagar was racked by internal strife. The most recent Nizam Shah had died in a border war with neighbouring Bijapur. In the ensuing power vacuum, none other than Chand Bibi laid claim to the throne through her nephew's Nizam Shahi blood. This caused the reigning Ahmed Nagari chief minister to make the fatal mistake of inviting the Mughals into his realm to protect his power. Sure enough, a mighty imperial host led by Prince Murad Mirza, son of Akbar, descended down on Ahmed Nagar. Realizing he'd made a deal with the devil, the minister fled the country, and the warrior Sultana seized the mantle of resistance. At Fort Ahmed Nagar, Chand Bibi met the Mughal army with her own. Donned in full armor and an Islamic veil, she flung herself into battle alongside her men. Ambar had not been idle either. He had long since left Bijapur with his contingent of cavalrymen and joined forces with his sultana. He and his fighters harassed the Mughal army during the battle, destroying provisions and disrupting supply lines. Exhausted and demoralized after a fruitless siege, the imperial forces soon withdrew. For a scant few years, there was peace in Ahmednagar, with Chand Bibi as regent. But in a climate thick with paranoia, it was not to last. In 599, Bibi met her end in typical Dukhani fashion, slain by her own soldiers, who were fueled by a false accusation that she was selling Ahmednagar out to the Mughals. Without the leadership of this iron-willed woman, the Imperials fell upon Ahmednagar once more the next year, easily taking it and capturing Bibi's young puppet nephew, thereby decapitating the country's government. It was now time for Malik Ambar to take to the main stage. In honour of his sultana, he pledged his fidelity to the Sult. The Deccan was his home, and he would not let it fall. With Ahmednagar's rightful heir in captivity and its army in disarray, Ambar took up the Herculean task of piecing together the tattered scraps of a nation while fending off Mughal expansionism. Fortunately, he had never stopped preparing for war. By 1596, his relentless raids on Mughal territory had brought 3,000 soldiers to his side. By 1600, this number had swelled to 7,000. Persians, Turks, Habshis and Marathi Hindus all joined the Abyssinian commander for plunder and freedom. The Mughals' conquest of Fort Ahmednagar granted them a tenuous hold on the Sultanate's capital city. Nevertheless, they found further ingress into Ahmednagari lands consistently foiled. Realizing he could never take the empire head-on, Ambar employed the tactic he called Bagi Giri. The native Marathis in Ambar's army were legendary for their deadliness as light cavalry. Once his scouts had informed him of a Mughal position, 
he deployed the mounted Hindu warriors to strike like lightning, destroying food and water supplies and harassing Mughal soldiers. The imperial forces, over-encumbered with their heavy cannons and lumbering war elephants, simply could not keep up and without provisions were forced to retreat. Ambar had turned the Mughal army's greatest strength, its size, into its greatest weakness. Even while fighting a guerrilla war, Ambar still had a government to rebuild. Dukhani nobles could never accept an African as their king, but Malik did not need a crown to rule. From neighbouring Bijapur, he fished out a young heir of the Nizam Shahi family and installed him as Sultan Murtaza Nizam Shah II. Ambar offered the new Sultan his daughter in marriage, tying himself closer to the royal line. As expected, the Oromo was appointed as Ahmednagar's regent minister by the puppet king he had installed, making him the de facto ruler of the revived Sultanate. From 1600 to 1610, Ambar walked on a tightrope, balancing war with the Mughals with the inherent perfidiousness of Dukhani politics. In 1603, he put down a rebellion launched by three of his officers, all while feigning a treaty with the Mughals so that they would not take advantage of the situation. 1605 saw the death of Emperor Akbar, who was replaced by his son Jahangir. The new Mughal sovereign launched campaigns into the Deccan with renewed vigour, but the effectiveness of Ambar's Bagigiri kept him at bay. Jahangir would struggle fruitlessly against the Abyssinian for decades, eventually growing so infuriated that he ordered an imperial portrait of himself shooting a decapitated Ambar in the head. This painting remained forever a fantasy, for the emperor would never capture his cunning foe. In 1610, Ambar was subject to more court intrigue. Up until then, the puppet on Ahmednagar's throne had been a compliant stooge. Ambar's daughter was but one of Sultan Murtaza's many wives, and one of them, a Persian woman, had since turned him against the regent minister with hushed words of sedition. Once he caught wind of this, Ambar had both the wife and the Sultan swiftly assassinated, installing the five-year-old Burhan Nizam Shah III to the throne. No one would threaten the Malik's control, especially not the Sultan's whose power came only by his accomplishments. Later that year, Malik's forces stormed and occupied Fort Ahmednagar, seizing it from the Mughal garrison. Galvanized by the string of victories that followed, Ambar moved Ahmednagar's capital closer to the Mughal border. In 1612, a treaty was secured with the empire, and the Abyssinian potentate was afforded time to build up his new city and secure stability in his realm. Over the next decade, commerce flowed into the new capital, which today is known as the city of Aurangabad. Ambar worked tirelessly to improve the infrastructure of his realm, overseeing the construction of an aqueduct system that fed clean water to his capital and its surrounding suburbs while actively maintaining and repairing the over 40 forts in his territory, ensuring he had touch points to spot the next Mughal invasion. Under his patronage, both Hindu and Muslim arts flourished, and palaces and mosques were erected to increase the prestige of Ahmednagar. Over the next few years, the truce with the Mughals was predictably broken, and fighting continued once more. In 1616, Ambar suffered his first major defeat against the imperial host, who used a system of trenches to entrap the Ahmednagari cavalry and devastate them with artillery. This loss gave the Mughals a stable foothold in Ahmednagar once more, and from there the situation continued to snowball. The Bijapur Sultan smelled blood in the water. Previously he had been an ally to Ambar in the war against imperial aggression, but by 1618, it became clear the Adil Shah intended to collaborate with the Mughals. Seeing their conquest of the Deccan as an inevitability, he conspired to destroy Ahmednagar for the preservation of his own realm. The noose was tightening around Malik's neck, and he knew he had to act swiftly, lest he be wiped from the pages of history. A spree of Bagigiri raiding in Bijapuri territory forced an allied Mughal Bijapuri army to meet Ambar on his own terms. On September 10, 1624, 
Ambar chose to make his stand in a fort within the village of Batvadi. The village stood on a hilly bluff overlooking the western shore of Lake Kalindi. It was the rainy season, so as the enemy's massive army approached, Ambar ordered the lake's dam struck and the lowlands flooded, turning the ground at the Mughal's feet into a thick, muddy bog. As he had done his whole career, Ambar turned his enemy's superior numbers and heavier units against themselves. Artillery, war elephants and infantry were wholly immobile in the wet hellscape that the Malik had created for them. Night after night, his Marathi cavalry sallied down the hillside while shrouded in darkness, destroying provisions and picking off the enemy. For the Mughal soldiers, the effect was thoroughly demoralizing. Gripped by terror and starvation, large chunks of the army defected to Ambar, who welcomed them warmly. With his army swelling and the Mughals shrinking, Ambar adjusted his doctrine and began attacking with wholesale cavalry assaults by day, devastating a foe that remained stuck in the mire and psychologically broken. Thoroughly beaten and incredibly humiliated, the Mughals were forced to retreat after sustaining heavy losses. Not only had Ambar once more humbled the mighty empire, he had foiled the attempts of his fellow Dikani Sultanate to collaborate in his destruction and ensured the independence of his realm. The Battle of Batvadi would be his greatest and last achievement. Two years later, Malik Ambar passed away at the ripe old age of 80. Unfortunately, Ahmednagar's rebel spirit died with him. Ambar's son succeeded him as regent minister but lacked his father's military mind. In 1636, the forces of Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan finally annexed Ahmednagar, ending over 30 years of war. Nevertheless, the legacy of Malik Ambar is still one to be admired. A military leader of exceptional skill, he consistently outwitted an empire he was thoroughly outnumbered and outgunned by for decades. No Mughal overlord, no matter how many dark fantasy paintings he commissioned, would ever get the best of Ambar. His physical footprint still remains in the Deccan today. The modern city of Aurangabad is in and of itself a testament to this, where the aqueducts that he built during his reign still stand, as does the austere tomb that he was buried in. By and large, they are a reminder of a time when an African ruled the heart of India.